And we're really discovering that our guts are terrible decision makers. Really, really horrible. <laughs> Why is that? This is Craig Wasselchak, and I am here with Gleb Siporsky, and he is the author of Never Go With Your Gut, which when I first heard about this book, I said, I go with my gut a lot, and that really got me a little bit confused. So what, what, how'd you come up with to write this book? Tell me a little bit more <laughs> about this, because, uh, you know, I've been talking to people, and everyone I talk to says they go with their gut. Yep, it's a common piece of advice and, you know, it's probably one of the most repeated pieces of business advice and it's also the most wrong piece of advice, I have to say. You know, if you look at medicine, we're now discovering that so much of what we thought about medicine that was right is actually very wrong. Now we're looking at the evidence-based medicine and we're, that was about 20 years ago when, you know, doctors started using checklists and actually washing their hands before <laughs> treating patients. And now the patient deaths in hospitals have greatly decreased over the last 20 years because of things like checklists. So right now, I'm in the cognitive neuroscience and behavioral economics looking at decision making, and we're bringing the same approach to businesses, evidence-based businesses. Because previously, you know, people were just deciding with their gut, their, their intuition, how do I go forward? What kind of decisions do I make? And we're really discovering that our guts are terrible decision makers. They're really, really horrible. <laughs> Why is that? So how did you decide to jump into this and figure out that this is what you want to do and your, your hmm. passion was there for this? My dad is someone who always went with his gut and who just said, you know, you should really always go with your gut. But one of the things that happened with him and my mom is that he was making some money on the side and he hid this money for a while. And when my mom discovered it, it was really, really, really bad. And that really struck me kind of as a really bad financial decision by my dad when I was a kid. Now, I was growing up in the dot-com boom and bust era. So I was born in 81. I was 18 in 1999, you know, for all of you who remember that party like it's 1999, right? <laughs> and it really was a party. You know, the dot-coms were booming, placed, you know, things like pets.com, webvan, boo.com, they were booming. And then once I was 21, they went bust. <laughs> in 2002. So that was a real eye-opener for how people who are supposedly smart invested hundreds of millions and billions actually of dollars into the dot-coms that went bust. And even worse from my perspective was that people like Bernie Eders and Enron and many others at WorldCom at Tyco, they used accounting fraud to hide the losses for their companies as a result of the dot-com bust. Now, most business leaders were pretty ethical and they didn't hide these losses. But these folks hid their, their losses. They greatly undermined trust in the business community and they caused an untold amount of suffering whether people lost their life savings. That was horrible. That's terrible. I mean, I'm a person who really cares about other people. My values are utilitarian. I want the most good for the most number. So I wanted to study this. You know, how could people do this? Both the you know, fraud, fraud and also the losses from the dot-com bust. What I discovered and what other people discovered is that the main reason for the fraudulent accounting wasn't because Bernie Eders and others wanted more money. They were already rich and they knew that they would be discovered. They knew that it was going to be a year or two and the fraud would be discovered. So the crucial thing for their decision making was that they went with their gut because they were afraid of losing social status, losing reputation. They didn't want to be seen as failures in the eyes of their fellow business leaders. And that was the crucial thing that caused them to make these horrible gut decisions. And that causes terrible gut decision make gut based decision making every day in so many companies. And so that's what really drove me to do this. So you saw the environment, you saw what was going on, you said, hey, I got to understand this. I want to figure it out and, and, and see where those bad decisions are being made within companies. Specifically individual business leaders, how did that come about? And so I started doing training, consulting, speaking. I started studying this at the same time I was doing training, consulting, speaking and coaching about this. 
and I went into academia, higher education. So I did research about this. I wrote some papers. I was a professor at Ohio State for seven years. And so that was another aspect of what I was doing. I was studying this at the kind of the top level of research. So, so I can imagine the, the first time you got up on stage in front of a group and you said, I'm going to be speaking about not going with your gut. Why do you advise people of this and what was the reactions? Oh, well, like it was a reaction kind of a lot like probably what you had when you heard, oh, not, not go with your gut. People were confused. People were surprised. It's not a comfortable message. And that's the critical thing about our gut. Our gut evolved, what the research discovered relatively recently, is that our gut evolved not for the modern business world, but for the ancient savannah. And so our gut is triggered by things that are related to the ancient savannah. Bernie Eders and other leaders who used accounting fraud scandals were triggered by tribalism. And that's what we were in in the savannah environment, in small tribes where social status was the most important thing for survival. It, where you were on the social status in the tribe meant that you either survived or didn't. So the people who were highest on the social status were the ones with the most power. And they were driven by the social status desire to make horrible decisions in the modern world. Now here in our modern business environment, of course we're not living in small tribes of 50 people or so. We're in huge multinational global corporations. And even if we're not, even if we're individual entrepreneurs, I mean, I run a business of six people, disaster avoidance experts, a consulting, training and coaching company. We're still relating to people all around the world. I mean, my clients are located all around the world. So I have to know how to engage with them. And so small business leaders have to know how to engage in the multinational global environment. And that's not what our gut is adapted for. So, so what did they say when you got up there and start talking about this gut thing? Well, they were confused and they were surprised. They said, hey, you know, I've been going with my gut all my life. That's kind of what I was taught. You know, why, why, do, why would people tell me to, you know, not go with, my gut, to go with my gut if that's bad advice? And what I told them, when you look at the research and why prominent gurus tell people to go with their gut, is because going with your gut feels very comfortable. And it's supposed to. It, it feels very comfortable. It feels just as comfortable as it does to, you know, take that second chocolate chip piece of cookie, right? It's, it feels very comfortable to take that chocolate chip cookie because in the savannah environment it was really important for us to eat as much sugar as possible in order to survive in the same way that the tribalism was really important but and so from here I'm, I'm going okay well if I'm comfortable with it and I've made pretty good decisions why wouldn't I go with my gut so this is the critical thing our gut feels comfortable and it feels what feels comfortable may not necessarily be the right thing at all. I mean, think about small businesses. About half of them, if you look at small small businesses, about half of them fail within five years. Yes. Half of small businesses, so half, I mean, and these are people who went with their guts, right? It feels very comfortable, and that's what they went with. If you look at this top business leaders, I mean, there was an interesting study of the companies that went bankrupt that had above $500, mil, 500 million in revenue from 1981 to 2007. There were something like 450 companies. Okay. It was found, and this is again 2007, so before the fiscal crisis. What the research found was that 46% of them went bankrupt purely because of terrible strategic decision making by the top leadership. It was about decision making. It was about poor decisions where people went with their gut and made really poor business choices, poor mergers and acquisitions. What do I do? What are you recommending? So you want to analyze your choices. There are some areas where your gut is going to be useful and helpful, and here they are. They are areas where you have often made right decisions in the past, where you know, in this specific area, I've made many good decisions in the past, and they're really correct. So for example, you've probably learned how to organize your time well. You know, you're an entrepreneur, you've done that a lot, you know how to do that. It's a hard skill to learn. And let's say you've learned how to delegate things well to other people. Again, that's a hard thing to learn. It's not easy to do that. Or you've learned how to take constructive critical feedback from customers and integrate that into your business. Not an easy thing to learn. So those are areas where you can be more confident of your decision making. However, 
that those areas they feel very comfortable as well as do things that aren't bad decisions so for example if you look at let's say hiring very many entrepreneurs make terrible hiring decisions why is that they don't have too much experience in hiring they don't have good systems they don't have good processes and there's extensive research showing that person-to-person -person interviews individual interviews are terrible ways of making decisions for hiring they don't predict for future success because there are some people who are skilled at interviews who are really bad at the job and vice versa people who are really good at the job who get really nervous in interviews so that's an example where you don't want to be confident in your decision making but people don't know that and they think that hey i'm doing well in delegating therefore i'm going to be doing well in interviewing so you need to be able to look at where did you make good decisions in the past and differentiate that from new areas so areas where you don't have too much experience areas where you haven't made many good decisions in the past another example that's really important for entrepreneurs is mergers and acquisitions there's extensive research showing that about 70 to 90 percent of mergers and acquisitions destroy value for companies whether it's acquisition whether it's a merger it's a huge hugely important decision that many entrepreneurs get very wrong so so you know the viewers that are going to be watching this, right, they're going to be on YouTube, they're going to be on LinkedIn, and, and you know, some of them will have businesses, and they'll be entrepreneurs and business owners, but there will also be employees that mm -hmm. will learn to, I guess, not go with your gut, right? So what do you suggest uh, things that you can do in typical decision-making processes throughout your day as the person that works for a company? I mean, in almost any business situation, almost any decision-making situations, you have five minutes to think about the decision. You don't need to rush it. So take five minutes and ask five key questions. And so here they are, and I'll read them out loud. I use, that, I use this card for people, for my clients, I make sure to give it to them so that they have this always in front of them. First question, what important information did you not yet consider about this decision? Now, why is that important? We tend to look for information that confirms our current beliefs, our existing beliefs, and ignore information that doesn't. So if we like a job candidate, we'll take, tend to take a look at only the information that confirms that this is a good job candidate. If we like a potential supplier, we'll take a look at the information that confirms the potential supplier is good. We don't try to disconfirm it. So you want to try to disconfirm your preferred choice. You want to, you want to evaluate why might it be wrong. And then if you can't demonstrate that, then that you should be more confident about it. Okay. So that's one. Two, what dangerous judgment errors did I not yet fully address? And we have many dangerous judgment errors that are in our heads that cause us to make pretty terrible decisions. I mean, let's look at WeWork uh, and the IPO, right? That's been in the news recently. You know, the WeWork was valued at about $47 billion by SoftBank, its main investor, about six months ago. Yeah. And as a result of its efforts to go out on the IPO, the recent valuation is about $8 billion. Now, yes. can you imagine that? Well, I've been watching that, and you know, being in the real estate business, I kind of looked at it and I said, there's something that doesn't look right here. Short-term leases, things that are coming up that just did not jive. How much value? $40 billion. $40 billion worth of value wiped out. What you're saying is people just kind of went with their gut along the way as Absolutely. the information came to them mm -hmm. versus looking into it, looking under the hood in the car and going, well, hey, what do we really have here? Yep, ex that's exactly right. They went with their gut, they went with their intuitions, they trusted the founder, Adam Newark, and look at what happened. $40 billion, I mean, imagine what you can do with $40 billion. So that's, look at, yep, so you want to look at what dangerous judgment errors might you be missing. Third, what would a trusted and objective advisor suggest that you do? Now this is really important. Think about people who you consider trusted and objective advisors in your life. You know, think about the person like a little angel on your shoulder, not the devil, but the angel on your shoulder. What would that person tell you to do? And you know, you can actually call that person and ask her, her or him what they would advise you to do. So that's the third question. Fourth question, how can this decision potentially fail? 
So you already kind of, the first three are about making the decision. The third, fourth question is about implementing it. How can it potentially fail? Think about all the ways that it can fail that are reasonable in your mind and address them in advance. Because, you know, if the WeWork IPO was addressed in advance, they would have found that, let's say, the screwy governance structure would have caused, wiped out a lot of value because it destroyed trust in WeWork as a company, which is one of the most fundamental things. You know, when you're looking at a tech company that has a lot of potential and future, trust is the most important thing, and that destroyed a lot of trust. Fifth one, what information would cause you to change your mind? Now, why is that important? It's important because it's very hard for us as human beings to change our minds. It really is. It's surprisingly hard because we commit to our decisions and we go forward and we are seen People are seen as strong leaders and in general as strong decision makers if they stick to their guns. So if you decide in advance what would cause you to change your mind, it would make it much easier to actually change your mind and it would look publicly better as well to others who know that you made this decision. It's also very helpful for group decision making because if you are part of a group, you'll often see that some people in the group disagree about a decision. And so when you they will then not have an opportunity to backbite and say, I told you so and so on. If you decide in advance, what would cause you to change your mind? Switching it a little bit more, let, let's go over to what types of problems the leaders run into when they go with their gut. And, you know, besides WeWorks, what are typical problems that you just see that common everyday things happen? Yeah, so I mentioned about the interview process, and that's a pretty common one. So one of my coaching clients had a small, I, small IT startup, and he hired a friend of his. So he went from the corporate world to start up a, his own shop, and he hired a friend of his from the corporate world to be his IT director after he was already established, had a few dozen employees, and this friend had difficulty fitting into the IT startup world. The friend thought that he wanted to be in a startup, and of course, that's the best way to make money in the IT sector. But the friend had a lot of trouble adapting to the chaotic environment of a startup, of a technology startup. And the friend didn't really believe that the founder would fire him. So much danger to hiring a friend because you can't, it would be very hard, it was very hard for this founder to have difficult conversations with the friend about the future. So that was incredibly difficult. I would strongly encourage founders to not hire friends. Don't hire someone who is a friend to work for you if you actually care about maintaining the friendship relationship. Don't hire friends and really don't hire family, okay? <laughs> and that's, you know, not going with your gut, right? What are other examples that uh, you see people run into besides hiring, maybe mm -hmm. a decision-making process sure. within businesses? One of the most typical thing, common things I see is people making plans. <laughs> and this is a big one. You know, we are too often told that, you know, failing to plan is planning to fail, right? That's oh, another big, yes. yes, that's another big common piece of advice. Failing to plan is planning to fail. And honestly, this is also really bad advice. Why is that? Well, our intuitions, our gut reactions, according to the research, is to plan for always for the best case scenario. We don't integrate nearly enough contingencies. We don't in into our plans for all the problems that will come up. So we actually develop a false sense of comfort and security when we make strategic plans. And it's I have very rarely we mm -hmm. plan for the best case scenario when we should be conservative in going through and testing it along the way of what could happen. Yes. And then we can reduce our chance of failure. Failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. Again, failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. So you want to look at how this plan how the situation might go wrong in the future and address all the problems in advance. So as an example, there is a manufacturer in Pittsburgh who I worked with, medium-sized manufacturer, and this planning mistake is called the planning fallacy. Basically, that's, that's what the cognitive neuroscientists and behavioral econom economists like myself call it. And so when I started talking about this in a training, he was like, oh yes, you know, this happens all the time. You know, we think a project will go 
will take two million and it takes take, instead takes three million and five more months than we tend to plan for it. And so that's another big common problem. And of course, I talked about the solution. Look at all the problems in advance and plan for them. That's one. Another one, if you've done this type of project before, look at your look at the past. Look at what happened in the past. Yeah. And yep, look at your history. See what happened and don't things will go better than they did in the past. I assume that they'll go about the same plan and about the same sort of resources because, and, and his company didn't do that. They said, you know, every time they thought it was going to be two million and it was three million and took quite a bit longer. Interesting with the startup companies, you find that they, they think they can get it done with two million and then they have to go back and ask for more money. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's say they really needed four million, and they took the numbers and they did the planning, like you're saying, instead of the gut, and then mm -hmm. they would have asked for four million, and they could be successful, versus going back and asking for money and having a chance of failure of not getting the extra two million dollars. People who invest in early startups know that startup investors screw up, and they're willing to give them more money if they have a better plan. <laughs> See that all the time in like the angel investing groups that I've attended. Mm -hmm. you, you see them coming back for more money. Actually, I was curious to ask you more about this. I know that you are in the entrepreneur organization, Craig. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and what the organization does, you know, whether it does angel investing or other stuff? Share more about that. The entrepreneur organization is a group of 14,000 entrepreneurs and we're global. I got involved a little over six years ago. I had a gentleman call me up. His name was John Cornelson. He said, hey, Craig, uh, you know, we, we found your name and, and we thought you would be a good candidate to join the entrepreneur organization. Kind of learn about us and see if we're a fit. And, and I first thing I said is, hey, I've already got a coach. I'm not interested, you know, and, and I've got everything going. And he goes, we'll fire that coach. And I go, that's pretty bold. So I turned around and I thought in my head and I said, well, if this guy's that bold, I'm going to go see what it is just to go from there. And I asked him along the way, I said, hey, so tell me about this. So I'm thinking in my head, I can sell him something, right? And, in the, in, and I said, okay, well, this might work. Okay, what type of businesses are in there? He said, well, they all do over a million dollars. Some of them do up to a billion dollars. There's a billion dollar club in there too. But um I said, well, that'd be good. So I bet a lot of them will have the type of products that, uh, you know, I sell. And, and he said, well, I've got some news for you. You can't sell to them. And I go, well, hold on now. I'm going to fire my coach, and I can't sell them anything. And you're saying you want me to join this, and this is worth my time? And I said, he said, well, if they approach you, and they understand you, and they trust you, and they understand what you do, they can come to you and go, hey, Craig, can you come over here and tell me a little bit more about your product? And then you could sell them some. And, and I said, oh, okay, so they can come to me, but I can't come to them. He said, just come on down here and see what it's about. So I went down there. I learned about it. And what I did is I found a, a group of entrepreneurs that were just like me. And we, we all, you know, it's one of those things when you're in a group of people that you relate to, and you can talk to, like, otherwise I would go home, talk to my wife, and my, my, my wife's gone, I don't want to hear all this stuff, you know, and, and, and if I'm in that group there, we have something that we relate to, we talk to, we strategize with, but the thing that's really unique about it is, it's all 100% confidential. None of the stuff we talk about goes outside the room, so that we can be vulnerable with each other and learn from each other through our experiences of what has gone on. So I ultimately joined, and I've been in there for uh, six years, and I'm active in there. And, and I also uh, coach uh, an accelerator group of younger entrepreneurs that are going from $250,000, and they're trying to reach up to about a million dollars so that they can join the regular entrepreneur organization group. So, and, and I like to give back my time to it. So, so that's where I fit in there. Now, I also belong to a forum and recently, in our last forum meeting, one of the questions that I asked on a round time, round table is, and, and what is a forum? Let me, let me kind of explain that. It's a group of about six to 10 people. We meet once a month, 
it's all confidential and we ask and help each other through experience share. We don't tell each other what to do and how to do it, but we experience share. What was I successful with or what was I not successful with so that it helps us not make mistakes. But during our updates, we have an opportunity to say, ask a quick question, go around the table and see what everyone does. Mm -hmm. okay? So one of the questions I asked two weeks ago was, <laughs> do you go with your gut? Went around the table, and every single person, including myself, said, yeah, I always lead with my gut. When I make a decision, I always feel my gut in the sense of, is it, is it telling me, yes, that's a good decision, or, or going from there? And, and, you know, it's interesting, in, in reviewing over your book, never go with your gut, right? The one thing that really related to me was, you know, if you're driving a car, you had to learn how to drive that car. But nowadays, we go with the gut feeling of, do I turn this way, turn that way, and whatever. But yes, I had to learn, and that's when I wasn't going with my gut, and I was learning the process. Yeah. And, and the other thing that I learned was, there's decisions that I'm already wise on because I've experienced it. And then there's decisions that I've never experienced before and that's helping me understand what you're saying. Because the first thing I said is, this is crazy. Why would I want to read this <laughs> from there? I'm, I'm not related yeah. to it. But now that I'm reading it, I'm having this aha moment that goes, that makes sense. So if I have not experienced it before, it means that I need to put up this alert that says stop. I've got to stop and go through a process, get as much information as I can, and then I can go forward from there. That's kind of what I do with the entrepreneurship organization. <laughs> it was kind of a unique experience that we got to talk about that as well. Having such a mastermind experience is very, very helpful. And I'm glad that uh, the, you, know, you had that question and had the opportunity to think about it. Because, like I said, entrepreneurs especially tend to be too confident, too optimistic about how wise their gut is. And they tend to use it for situations in which it's not a good fit in new situations, which they're not familiar with because they're confident about their past decisions. So that's a very dangerous time for entrepreneurs. And that's when a lot of folks make mistakes. So for example, I know that you sold your business, which, we, which you ran for 27 years. I recently talked to a business broker here in Columbus, Ohio, and he was telling me about how many people make terrible choices, terrible decisions when they're trying to sell their business and their business goes for much less than it actually, it actually should because they go with their gut as opposed to actually evaluating the situation, going with their head and going for a good process. Yeah, you, you probably learned about this. Tell me about this. Yeah, so, so when, when I went to uh, sell my business, the first thing I did was come to my entrepreneurship organization forum and said, I have an opportunity here, guys. I've sold businesses, but it's been over 20 years. What are your thoughts? And they said, okay, here's some resources that we've seen that should give you some good direction. And here's some of our thoughts and shares that we went through. And one of the ones that they said is go through a, uh, a business broker meeting yep. where they're, they're sharing information on the process. So I went through that process and I learned as much as I could and I pulled in everything that I could. And yeah, I wasn't going with my gut. <laughs> but how in the world am I gonna figure this out and get my multiplier higher? Mm -hmm. Interesting yes. enough, the gentleman that I was working with on uh, selling the business, I ended up putting him with the buyer mm -hmm. instead of working with me because it was a better fit to get the deal done. Of course, the multipliers that we talked about when they came back and gave me the offer were not near what he had said when he was working with me. So there was an uphill battle against one of the best in the industry. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the end, when we did it, because I did my due diligence, I got higher than the industry average based on systems and what we had implemented within the business. And I'll say this, not going with my gut. There you go. Not going with my gut. So that was a perfect example <laughs> where 
The <laughs> other thing that, that uh, I come back and say, you know, if I wouldn't have been in the entrepreneur organization and been involved with the form, I bet you anything I would still be owning that business and not focusing on where I need to go as well. But when the opportunity came, I understood how to do it. And it made it a win-win solution for my customers because I dearly love my customers. And I really like the guy that bought the business. And, and I can see the success and the win-win from it. So that's what's so amazing. That's a great story. And that's a great example of where it's a new situation. You're not familiar with it. I'm glad that you, you, know, you essentially used a question free. What trusted and objective advisors can you tap to, <laughs> to help you make a wiser decision? And here you go. And you were able to tap these folks. And I'm glad that you had that opportunity. That's great. Uh, so you've done you. So you've sold your business. And I know you've been working on a new business, Crushing B2B. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Just what are you doing? What What are your goals? You know, you know with Crushing B2B, it's, it's an interesting story because when I had my other business, I had gone to a, a group. It's called Business Owners Ed. And it's a group of very successful business people that give their time back to a select group that apply to come to a seminar that they have for 10 weeks in a row. And they go from 4 o'clock in the afternoon to 8 o'clock at night, and they just pump all their knowledge into mm -hmm. it. And there was a group of, I think it was 10 or 12 of us that got selected for it. So I go to the meeting and, and I get there, they give me a name tag, I put it on, then I look around the room and I'm going, there's a lot more than 10 or 12 chairs here. <laughs> what are all these other chairs here for? And they're going, well, that's the audience. And I'm going, you mean I got to be up here with everyone? Anyway, I got to go through that process. And one of the things that we figured out was, Craig, you need to build an inbound process for lead generation. I said, yeah, I know that. <laughs> I hadn't figured it out. And they go, we're going to figure this out for you. So by the time we were done with it, since I sold business to business with a unique product just in the industry, we happened to sell postage meters and copiers. We came up with LinkedIn was the platform. But when I was done with it, LinkedIn wasn't quite ready. It's kind of like a bell curve. Hmm. And we were down at the very bottom of the bell curve and it hadn't changed and got ready. So 18 months later, which was uh, uh, August, two years back, they changed the platform where you can embed in native video. And a lot of the creators and the people from Facebook and other platforms that had some business business experience came over to the platform and started generating some interest in it. So about April, I figured that out. And I started testing things on the platform and my mind is very analytical. So what mm -hmm. I do is I want to understand the analytics of it. And if you do this, what happens? So I would do A-B testing. The first time I did the post, of course, I was scared to put a video up. And I kind of fiddle faddled around with it. And, and I found this uh, thing on uh, my Apple phone for iMovie that you can make a cartoon on. And mm -hmm. I kind of just made a, you know, a, a a valuable post and I put it on with a cartoon saying this is what I was doing and it immediately went viral. Hmm. We had 8,500 people that watched it and for what I was doing in my industry that was unheard of. So hmm. you know, it's not a huge viral but it was something that really worked and I said hey I'm on to something. So I turned around and I tested the next one using the cartoon again and it was working. And I kept testing. So I tested for over a year on it, the platform and figuring out everything as I went through the business cycle and everything started working. So I started documenting a process. I documented a 14 step process that this is how you generate leads and brand your company so you can generate revenue off the platform. Because it went okay in my ages, right? We had to pick up the yellow pages and we had to dial and go find what we needed from the yellow pages. There's no trust, right? Yep, yep, I, under, I remember that, I remember that. Yeah, so, so nowadays, LinkedIn is the modern day interactive yellow pages. Yep. So if they watch us and they learn about us and they see that we're good people here, they tend to want to do business with us. So on that bell curve, right? 
Right now, we're still at the very bottom of the bell curve. I would say we're about 15% up the bottom of the bell curve, but that bell curve is fixing to go up really steep in 2020 as businesses start adopting to the platform and understanding they got to build trust. Mm -hmm. The other things that we see are the companies that are out there and they're publicly traded, they are held accountable to the stockholders. Mm -hmm. And they have to make decisions based on having quarterly profits. The problem with LinkedIn is it's a long game. Okay, it goes anywhere from 12 to 18 months to be able to get a successful campaign and build it. But it's kind of like having a snowball coming down a mountain. Once it gets part way down, this thing's a big, huge ball coming down and going to just overtake the bottom of the mountain. So LinkedIn is the same way. Once you get the branding going, and then once you get the lead generation system going, you're going to leapfrog your competition. And it allows you to start controlling the environment that's there. And as companies start waking up to that and they understand the processes that are out there to be able to own this, these are the people that are going to change and disrupt this whole entire market. So there's going to be some aha moments in 2020. And I'm, I'm really excited about what the opportunity is and where we'll go from there. I like what you were talking about, the analytic approach to it. Okay, that's a hard thing to do. I think most people, when they use social media, they just go with their intuitions, right? Go with their gut. And it sounds like what you're trying to do is you really use an analytic approach and use your head as opposed to using your gut to approach and think about how do you make effective lead generation based on the numbers, based on the rational thinking, based on logic, based on the data. Does that sound right? Absolutely. So uh, are you familiar with the DMAIC? Where you no. go around and you measure your systems every time and you make oh, yes. adjustments on it. Mm -hmm. and either you go forward or you go back to the drawing board and make changes mm -hmm. and changes. And that's exactly what we did. It's part of the process that we teach is stick to the systems. Mm -hmm. Get the emotion in there, go through it. But you're, you're exactly right. It's not a gut thing that we do. And the farther you get away from your gut on this, the more successful you can be in getting the reactions that you need, get the viewers that can see your posts that are out there and get the right people in there. Because you don't just go on to social media and start connecting with everyone. <laughs> you want to get your target audience in there. And when people look at LinkedIn, they think, oh, this is a social media thing. And it's nothing but a database. It's pretty. It has activities on it, has video on it, but it's nothing but a database, right? And we're all going to use it to do lead generation mm -hmm. and share ideas and help the community. And that's what it's for. So it's a modern day Yellow Pages that's interactive. That's the yep. way I look at it. I think that's a good way. I, I, I totally understand that. I think that's a wise way of looking at it. And one of the things that I found really interesting was how you were talking about measuring things and going back to the drawing board. There's a, one of the dangerous judgment errors we have as human beings is called the false consensus effect. What that means is that we tend to think about other people in the same way that we think about ourselves. So what people would tend to do intuitively would make posts that would be appealing to themselves. They wouldn't be thinking about their customers. They wouldn't be thinking about, oh, I am not the same person as my customer, usually. <laughs> so you want to think about what your customers engage with, and that makes it much more difficult. Do you find that people you run into that all the time and, and when you're putting a post together and you're putting it out on LinkedIn you need to send spend about 60% of your time on the first sentence and second sentence in a post or in an article that you set out because as people scroll up and down that's the thing that they read and that's the headline to get their attention and if you don't spend the time creating something that gets their attention. Who cares about your attention? It's, 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 it's lead generation or creating value for the group. And one of the things that I always say is, if you're going to do this, 80% of your time needs to be spent on creating value. 20% mm -hmm. yes. of your time talks about what you can do for them within your company. So for example, when you post on there, right? If you take the concept and you just created value, how do you get connections? People want to connect with you because they can learn from you. Yep. 
But exactly. if, you're, if you're doing nothing but going, hey, I have a <laughs> follow me, okay? They, they kind of get bored with it, right? But yeah. if you have the aha moments that come out here and you, and you give things that create value that can use within their business or their daily lives, that's huge. And yes. people want to connect with you and they start trusting you. So mm -hmm. that's, that's what I see is that the genius of LinkedIn is creating trust. And creating those relationships and the other thing is picking up the phone and talking to someone or even you and I interacting on here creating an environment where people can learn about us is huge <laughs> and, and I just went up to uh, Fayetteville and I met with a guy for breakfast and, and we went out and we recorded it and, and you know the building of our just the connection of understanding another person, seeing them face to face, is huge. And, and you feel comfortable that you would do business with them. Now, the other thing that I see on the, on the opposite end of it is people will send a connection request, and I bet you get them all the time. And the first thing they do is connect with you, and then they dump a big sales thing on you. And that's those probably three to four percent of the people just don't understand the platform and that. If you went into a room of people, let's say we had 100 people in this room, and the first thing you did is go up and say, hi, I have a book, can you go <laughs> buy it? <laughs> you don't do that. And nope. People don't understand that in, in, when it comes to social media, but if they walked in a room, I guarantee you they don't just walk up to someone and say, buy my book or <laughs> no insurance or you know whatever. It's just for some reason they just don't get on social media. And that's the one thing that I want to help change. I want to make sure that everyone understands how to help each other. And that's creating value on the platform so that people can go, hey, you don't do that here. This is what you do. Mm -hmm. And it helps us all rise to that next level of selling and helping each other. Create good relationships. I highly recommend to get the book and learn about not to how how not to go with your gut because when I look back at some of the decisions I've made, it was because bad decisions were because I went with my gut in areas that I wasn't familiar with and that's where I made mistakes and that's where you talked about many businesses go with their gut when they are first starting up and they just don't have the experience versus could they go to a mentor or mm -hmm. could they go to a consultant that's already gone through that experience and, and go from there. And, and the one thing that we do see on the platform of LinkedIn is we have a lot of entrepreneurs. <laughs> Those people that go out and they go with their gut, they quit their job and they start this other stuff and, and it causes all kinds of financial headache and problems within their families. And they've got to, that, that is, you know what? The entrepreneurs need to read this. Yes. This will change their life and really make sure that if they want to start a business, they understand how to make good decisions. I highly recommend it. Excellent. Well, thank you, Craig. I really appreciate that. And I hope that folks who are further along in their stage of business, check out Crushing B2B. You know, folks who are ready to crush B2B, who really know that they're selling B2B and they want to use LinkedIn as an effective platform. You know, it's not just a entrepreneur that should be reading this book. I mean, I've been in business for going on 30 years and I'm just now having the aha moments of it and starting mm -hmm. to understand that's the process that I should go through when I find there's something that I'm not experienced with. I got to really dig into the research, get my team to dig into it, give me good results so I can make good decisions. Hey, I appreciate it. This is a great interview and I think we're uh, creating some great value on LinkedIn and in YouTube where we can share this uh, with the world and help them. I hope folks check it out. Thank you. Mm -hmm.